have one more talk before our afternoon break. It's going to be by Dr. Peter Stock, looking at therapies to cure diabetes. And this should be an interesting talk. Thank you, Dr. Stock. Thank you. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I actually um, am a little bit nervous. I don't know how many of you were here when I gave this talk 28 years ago for the first time. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, you know, we, we thought that um, some of these therapies were right around the corner. So um, we've, we've rounded the corner. <laughs> Hang in there now. Okay, so um, I think m more than any other transplant, liver, kidney, um, we've made huge advances in the world of pancreas transplantation. Um, we've also made really significant advances in the world of islet transplant um, in terms of insulin independence, normalization of hemoglobin A1C, and abrogation of the very devastating secondary complications of diabetes. So much so that this was the cover, uh, this was based on an article that we published in the American Journal of Transplant, um, asking um, uh, of all the options for diabetes, who's going to win out? Is it the pancreas transplant, that's that guy with a duodenum sitting on his head, um, the islets on the right side, and that thing in the back is a computer. And um, you may, may have a lot of questions about the closed loop. Um, uh, we can put a man on the moon. It seems like we should be able to put a device in somebody that could secrete insulin. So those three things are all advancing at the same time, and we got to sort of figure out how to uh, triage the patients. Now, even though we've had these great successes, um, our colleagues in endocrinology aren't so convinced. And in fact, in this, um, the, the last thing that was published in uh, Diabetes Care, uh, from the uh, Endocrine Society uh, regarding recommendations for the management of hypoglycemia and diabetes, uh, transplantation, islet or pancreas transplantation, wasn't mentioned once in the article. <clears throat> now, I want to show you this data uh, because this shows where hemoglobin A1c stand after um, uh, intensive insulin therapy, standard insulin therapy, and after pancreas transplantation, with that solid white line there being where it should be. And you can see st people on standard insulin therapy and our, our management of diabetes patients is really poor out there in the community. Um, hemoglobin A1C is between eight and nine. Uh, with intensive therapy, down around seven, but that subjects them to uh, these significant problems with hypoglycemic unawareness. And then finally, um, uh, pancreas transplants, uh, we do a pancreas transplant, 90% um, of them are successful um, over, over a year's time as defined by insulin independence. And if you, um, the, <clears throat> the minute you put in a pancreas, you get insulin independence. And if you get insulin independence, look where your hemoglobin A1Cs, they're, they're down around five. This is also an important uh, figure because um, hemoglobin A1C correlates with the complications of diabetes. As your hemoglobin A1C goes up, your complications of retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy um, progress. So what are the goals of therapy? Um, I think with insulin therapy, we can get the hemoglobin A1Cs down with intensive therapy, but the more intensive the therapy, the increase the incidence of hypoglycemic, hypoglycemia and hypoglycemic unawareness in the long term. With islet transplants, we can normalize hemoglobin A1Cs we really do abrogate hypoglycemic unawareness, but we don't always succeed in getting patients completely off of insulin, and that is really where we want to go with this. And then with pancreas transplants, hemoglobin A1Cs normalize. Um, they don't have hypoglycemic unawareness, and they don't require insulin. Uh, so because we've gotten a lot better at pancreas transplant, we've extended the indications. We'll now, uh, if somebody have a, has a living donor kidney, they're type 1 diabetic, We'll move forward with a pancreas transplant after some, some a level of stabilization. Um, and we also are doing, very rarely still, uh, pancreas transplants in the preuremic diabetic patient with a great deal of success, and I'll show you some uh, data with that. So I'm going to show you some international data now uh, that comes from uh, um, a registry that is in part maintained by UNOS, but it's also um, maintained um, uh, through the JDRF and um, uh, some other organizations internationally. So um, uh, the data is uh, pretty interesting. So for pancreas transplants alone, one year unadjusted patient survival for uh, all categories of pancreas transplantation up there around 95%. Five year 
somewhere around 90%. So we're, we're doing really well with patient survival in all categories of um, um, pancreas transplantation. In fact, if you look at the one and three year um, UNOS data on living donor kidney survival, patient survival, and all pancreas transplants, all categories of pancreas, they're pretty close. Simultaneous pancreas kidney transplants, almost identical. Um, and, and then at the bottom, we have um, patients who get a deceased donor uh, kidney transplant. So the punchline here is that pancreas transplants don't threaten lives. So keep that in mind. Um, it's a very unnatural act of pancreas transplant, and I don't, um, I don't know how many surgeons there are here. I think there's probably not a great deal of interest in hearing about the technical aspects. Suffice it to say that we put the kidney and uh, kidney on the left side in the standard location, extra, uh, where we normally put it extra peritoneally. We do a one midline incision. We put the kidney into the left iliac vessels. We put the pancreas with a segment of donor duodenum into the right iliac fossa, and then we drain the exocrine contents of the pancreas directly into the bowel. And that's the Achilles heel of this operation because now we're draining digestive enzymes, which account for about 85% of the pancreas, um, uh, into the bowel. And if that anastomosis breaks down or those enzymes get activated, it's like having acute pancreatitis, hemorrhagic pancreatitis. It's a mess, and the pancreas has to come out. That's the Achilles heel. But technically, we've gotten, we've gotten much better at that. And um, uh, to the point, as I mentioned before, that 90% of our patients uh, have a technically successful graft uh, at the end of one year. Uh, we've also gotten a lot better with immunosuppression. We used to have, when I started to do this, incidences of rejection of either the kidney or the pancreas over 80%. We're down to now 10 to 15% episodes of rejection with a fairly aggressive immunosuppression consisting of lymphodepletion with thymoglobulin. Um, and we tend to use low-dose uh, tacrolimus and MMF. Occasionally, we'll add low-dose uh, TOR inhibitors, low-dose um, uh, everolimus, serolimus. Here's the survival uh, benefit uh, that was just published in JAMA in 2015, and it shows that if you get a, um, an, a, a simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant, that's that top dotted line, um, you, you see um, pretty good survival out 20 years, certainly out 10 years, compared to patients who don't get transplanted. The more important figure is this one. For patients we put on the list who, are, um, who have diabetes, um, and are uh, waiting for a transplant, 50% of them uh, don't make it um, five years. So uh, we, we really need to do better. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to get to some of that in a second. So how do we do uh, with allograft success defined by insulin independence? Um, the best is with a simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant. You could see the one-year uh, graft success is over 90%. In fact, it's about 90% insulin independence for all the categories. A five-year survival is best for, for uh, simultaneous pancreas kidney transplants. You can see insulin independence, uh, 80% at five years. Um, <clears throat> similarly, um, uh, it's, it's, it's also uh, good kidney function in those patients uh, because if you give them a pancreas transplant, you... Uh, you saw the data in the beginning, normalization of hemoglobin A1Cs, you don't get recurrent diabetic nephropathy, which is very important. All these transplants that we're doing in patients with poorly controlled diabetes, they're gonna get recurrent disease in the simultaneously in the kidney um, uh, if they don't have good control of the diabetes. Uh, we're not quite as good with pancreas after kidneys or pancreas transplants alone. You could see that the five-year results in that category are um, somewhere around 50 to 60%, but we're getting better, and I think it'll creep up to that in a few years. Uh, typically, the patients that we consider for pancreas transplant, it's their first transplant, they're not highly sensitized, their type 1s typically have been type 1s, less than 55 years of age, and have had BMIs um, less than uh, 30. With our improved results, I'm now going to tell you about something that you um, uh, may, um, may um, not um, uh, fully appreciate, but um, uh, we're starting to to extend our criteria. And we are extending our criteria to include type 2 diabetics 
who phenotypically look like type 1 diabetics. So we, we don't really have a good grasp of what type 2 diabetes is. It comes in all sorts of flavors, but many of you have seen uh, the patients that um, aren't on huge doses of insulin. Um, they're slender, um, yet they become, uh, they, they develop diabetes at a, in the 20s and 30s, um, and um, uh, they don't look uh, like uh, it's based on insulin resistance. Um, so how are we going to extend the criteria? One interesting piece, we've, we've been fairly restrictive at UCSF in terms of the age of the recipient for all pancreas transplants. We've said, oh, we should, uh, they should be 40 at the time of listing. We don't really want to um, go above 55. But look at the national and international data. Um, the patients who are over 60 do just as well, if not a little bit better. So it's really not about the age, it's about the cardiac um, workup. The other thing that's quite fascinating is about 10% of the patients traditionally have had type 2 diabetes. They're C-peptide positive. And this is the national data. And you could see survi patient survival by diabetes type um, over four years, pretty, pretty close. And look at allograft success by diabetes type, also uh, over 80%. We just did a transplant about eight months ago in a patient who had large insulin requirements. She was over 50, um, uh, but she was slender. Um, her, he, she's done extremely well with hemoglobin A1Cs under five um, and really uh, tolerated the procedure well. So I think we have a lot to learn about who, who we should be doing these pancreas transplants in. But if you, if you have patients uh, that are type two, that develop their diabetes in the 20s, in their 20 to 30s. They're not particularly overweight, probably don't have a lot of insulin resistance. Those are patients we should be considering for uh, simultaneous pancreas kidney transplants. And there's a number of patients out there. Um, with um, type 1 diabetes, the predominant um, uh, race is Caucasian. Um, but if we uh, look at the type 2s, um, it's a pretty much an equal mix of Caucasian, African Americans, Hispanics, and and uh, as a result of that, we're we're now starting to do transplants in more people of African descent. I think mostly because we're considering um, uh, uh, these folks with type two diabetes. So, what are the pros of successful pancreas? The, the pros of pancreas transplant: it's a single organ transplant. Um, it doesn't matter if pe patients are large men or petite women, um, we get insulin independence in over 90%, and we get that right out of the starting gates. It prevents hypoglycemia, it normalizes hemoglobin A1Cs, it improves quality of life. I cannot emphasize that enough, so much so that any patient who's had insulin independence loses their pancreas for rejection or some other reason. Every last one of them wants another pancreas transplant. Uh, it it reverses over time peripheral neuropathy. It certainly prevents recurrent diabetic nephropathy, and it may prolong life. So why do I even want to talk about cellular transplants? We need to get him an intervention that we can get to before the patients progress with their cardiovascular complications because those are not reversible. Islet transplants, we know they work. We know they work because um, in uh, uh, patients who have chronic pancreatitis, we can take out the pancreas for pain. That's why we take it out, but that leaves them profoundly diabetic. We can um, isolate the islets from those pancreases if the pancreas isn't too damaged, give them their own islets back into the liver. We just inject it into the liver and they flow out into the sinus sinusoids of the liver. And those patients can become insulin independent as long as we can get enough islets out of the pancreas. But it shows it will work. We can make patients insulin independent, but we don't have to worry about autoimmune disease, and we don't have to worry about alloimmune disease. Now, if we talk about doing islet transplants in, um, in uh, patients with type 1 diabetes, it hasn't been that successful, and it wasn't successful until uh, James Shapiro up in Edmonton, Canada decided, well, we'll give islets, aloe islets, from deceased donors, 
we won't give just one dose, we'll give two doses and three doses until we get the patients insulin independent. In other words, give them enough islets and they will become insulin independent. And he tried not to use immunosuppression that made patients diabetes, have diabetes. Steroids, he got rid of steroids. Um, and he tried to minimize the calcineurin inhibitors. We know Prograf um, is, uh, and cyclosporin, uh, both are toxic to islets. So it, it was really neat. He, got, uh, he increased um, uh, insulin independence following islet transplants from down around 10% all the way up to over 90%. But here was the problem. Two years later, all those patients became diabetic again. So they didn't last. And people wondered why was that, and um, was it that we weren't giving a precursor population of beta cells with the whole pancreas? Maybe. Um, but Bernard Herring um, at the University of Minnesota decided to give more potent immunosuppression. I think we were a little bit misguided in the beginning. We thought that little population of islets they wouldn't need very much immunosuppression, and that is, that's wrong. If you use more potent immunosuppression, uh, we, you, you can get, he got 50% of his patients to be insulin independent at five years. And then, if you look at the National Registry, that the, the table on the right is patients who received lymphodepleting regimens for induction, so really potent. The potent immunosuppression that I was talking about, thymoglobulin, Campath, they, you started to see insulin independence rates of pushing 50%. In fact, if you look at the centers, um, many centers now are reporting a uh, five-year insulin independence rate greater than 50%, including ours, which is the fourth one down. Greg Zott is the guy who isolates the islets, um, and um, a Andy Posalt is, is, uh, has run this program. It's really neat. We get, we're up around 80% at at that's actually four years, um, at rates of insulin independence. And um, <clears throat> the one thing I have to tell you is we are very selective about the patients that we do islet transplants in. So we don't do large men with high insulin requirements. So keep that in mind as I show you some of this very exciting data. Um, this, uh, the table on the right is a patient on normal insulin therapy. That's the variation in blood sugars uh, with a continuous glucose monitor. And after a successful islet transplant, one that engrafts, you could see the hemoglobin A1C is stable. And not only that, this is uh, also data from Canada, this from Vancouver. Um, you can uh, prevent the secondary complications with an islet transplant. But there's huge challenges um, precluding wider application of, of this. Um, immunosuppression associated with it, it has been associated with degradation of renal function in, in patients who they've done islet transplants and the preuremic patients who they were trying to prevent progression. In other words, they gave them Prograf or calcineurin inhibitors. And as a result of that, these patients who, who, who didn't have problems with their kidney function developed problems with their kidney function. And what was worse is giving multiple infusions of islets sensitized patients, and that prevented them from getting a kidney transplant. Uh, we adopted a protocol 10 years ago now, over 10 years ago, um, uh, through the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation where we used uh, drugs, uh, we had access to some of the more interesting uh, drugs at the time. I, I, I think Flavio's probably up there. These were all drugs that we got access to because he first did the trials in kidney patients. One of them is Bilatacept, co-stimulation blockade with Bilatacept. And the other is a drug called Raptiva, which is an adhesion molecule blocker. Also uh, tried, tried uh, uh, in kidney transplants, both successful in kidney transplants. The neat thing about co-stimulation blockade with um, bilatacept or uh, adhesion molecule blockers with Raptiva, those drugs have no nephrotoxicity. They are incredibly well tolerated. So we did a protocol where we didn't want to use prednisone, we didn't want to use any calcineurin inhibitors, and we used maintenance therapy with co-stimulation blockade and either serolimus or um, um, Celsep, mycophenolate mofetil. And I don't want to go into a great deal of detail. Just remember our maintenance. We use thymoglobulin induction, potent induction up front, and then maintenance with either uh, Bilatacept or Raptiva. 
And here is 10-year results. Um, the yellow line are patients that are insulin independent. The blue line is patients that are partially insulin independent. And the red line uh, means they're back to their full use of insulin. You could see half of the patients, half, have insulin independence at 10 years. Um, and many of those with a single infusion of islets. Uh, a, a couple of patients have gone on to require a second infusion. Um, but more interestingly, um, the um, uh, three patients um, who went back to full use insulin um, decided they wanted a pancreas transplant because they had enjoyed several years of insulin independence with the islets and we didn't have any viable protocol to retransplant them. So in those patients, this is what happened to their hemoglobin A1Cs um, in both, both arms. Um, this is uh, their C-peptide response to a mixed meal tolerance test, pretty normal. And what about kidney function? Because that was what we were so worried about. In both groups, the kidney function actually improved a little bit over time. It's certain that's not statistically significant, but it didn't get worse, and that is significant. And then I just want to tell you about one patient who um, she comes. I just she just came. Uh, I have to. I teach a class on um, uh, at the university on uh, stem cell therapy, and this uh, patient comes to talk about her experience with islet transplants. What we found in the Raptiva group in the Afaluzumab group was this profound increase in the T regulatory lymphocytes that that was generated. With, with the one patient that I'm going to tell you about, she's the one who got 70% of her circulating T lymphocytes were T reg and phenotype. Uh, we didn't see that in the Bilatisep group. We did see it in the Afaluzumab group. And this one patient who had the 70% um, uh, <laughs> increase in her uh, circulating T lymphocytes, it's so interesting what happened with her because she... Um, uh, she had profound immunosuppression <laughs> in the first six months, and she had pneumonia, and she said, Dr. Stock, I like being insulin independent, but I want my immune system back. And so um, I, um, I said, could you just decrease it, and we left, maintained her just on cell sept. And then um, three years later, three years later, she complained of gum disease, uh, having really loose teeth, the oral surgeon biopsied her gums, and she had lymphoproliferative disease. At that point, we stopped all immunosuppression. She got rituximab, and we, we, I told her that I don't know what's going to happen to her islets. That was at five years. We're now five years after that. She is still insulin independent. So she's truly tolerant. She's, she's not diabetic. Her hemoglobin A1C was 4.8. Um, she's 70 years old, and um, she looks like she's about 55. And she said, um, she told me, um, uh, y y you know, she's very matter of fact about um, uh, the course she's had. I mean, I'm not really proud that we have a patient that's insulin independent. We gave her lymphoproliferative disease, we gave her pneumonia. Um, but now she is indeed insulin independent and operationally tolerant. And we have a second patient in that Raptiva group. Um, that it also looks like she's going to be tolerant. Her only immunosuppression is 250 milligrams of cell sap twice a day, and she's also 10 years out. Um, we're hesitant to completely stop immunosuppression. I think we could. Um, unfortunately, we don't have access to Raptiva anymore. It got pulled from the market. It was used to treat psoriasis, um, and it was used in, um, I think it was tried in 4,000 patients, and four patients developed JC virus and they pulled it from the market, and we can't get it back. Um, but it just goes to show you, you know, pretty, pretty neat results. Now, I told you that three of the patients um, became insulin dependent again, and they wanted um, another infusion of islets. There was no protocols for that. We gave them pancreas transplants. Um, all three of them are insulin independent now five years after pancreas transplantation. And um, in fact, we've done seven islet, uh, solid organ pancreas transplants after islet transplants. All seven patients are insulin independent at a mean of now seven years after um, um, pancreas transplantation. So you could start to see we have multiple therapies. Um, I could go through the algorithm with you of uh, who we should do pancreas transplants on. Um, and really, any uh, type 1 diabetic 
patient who's in end-stage renal failure should be considered for beta cell replacement. If they, are, if they have low insulin requirements, small body habitus, I think you could consider islet transplants. Um, I would do a pancreas transplant if their cardiovascular status is in good enough shape and you're doing an operation anyway. If they have high insulin requirements and a, and, and a, or a large body habitus, if they're at a low cardiovascular risk, go ahead with a pancreas transplant. If they're a high cardiovascular risk, I think you might want to consider islet transplant. Your chance of getting them off of insulin are slim. Um, I think it's a little bit of a different story with um, preuremic patients. Um, if they have life-threatening complications, people have to set their alarm clock every night because they're afraid they're not going to wake up, um, and they are a high cardiovascular risk, you could think about an islet transplant. Low cardiovascular risk, I would do an islet or a pancreas transplant. If there's no life-threatening complications, I would just continue medical management. But here, here's the punchline. If, if this table, this figure, if that represents the close to 2 million people in the US with type 1 diabetes, pay attention to that one dot at the top. That right there, that little green dot, that's the number of patients that we can help with a pancreas or islet transplant in the sea of type 1 diabetics. I'm not even talking about type 2 diabetics. That's who we're helping. Our beta cell mass is severely limited. And now I'm going to tell you about the future because it's, it's very exciting on multiple levels. First of all, can you make a beta cell from a stem cell? The answer is yes. There's uh, two groups really that have gone, gone made a stage eight beta cell from um, either a, a pluripotent stem cell, um, IPS, or an embryonic stem cell. Um, they've gotten insulin producing beta cells. Um, one group, uh, Doug Melton's group in Boston, um, Kiefer's group up in um, uh, Vancouver, um, both have beautiful beta cells function pretty nicely. Uh, we also have uh, one of my colleagues at UCSF, Matthias Hebrock. He's got a pretty good beta cell, too. Um, you may be familiar with this trial that was done um, in conjunction with the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. They tried to put this um, stem cell cluster. It was a stage four. So uh, they had uh, propagated the, the, the um, differentiation of, of the embryonic cell to a, to a beta cell, but at stage four, they took it out and they transplanted it. And over the course, it, they, they knew from small animal models that it took about a month or two months, and these cells fully matured in vivo and, and could turn around insulin. The problem was uh, they, they were pluripotent, so they could still make little tumor cells not malignant, but neoplasms. So the FDA um, worked with, um, with um, the group Viacite down in Southern California, actually, who had the stem cell. They encapsulated it and did subcutaneous transplants. And this is the trial you may have heard about. The problem is encapsulating the islets um, and putting them in a location where you could remove them if they developed a problem. Um, it didn't work. They didn't survive. Um, they couldn't survive the, um, uh, the encapsulation. So flash forward now to um, the current st status. Um, we need an engraftment site um, that we can pull cells out of uh, in case we get into trouble. And along those lines, uh, Injecting islets into the forearm, into the muscle or the subcutaneous tissue, seems like a, a logical, obvious choice. We have tried for a long time to put islets into that area so we didn't put them into the liver. Putting them into the liver, it's estimated that only 10% of the cells that we inject survive. So um, if, you, if you look at a mouse model, take human, human cells and put it into an immunodeficient mouse, um, about maybe 30 or 40 percent of the cells survive in the kidney capsule, less in the subcutaneous, somewhere around 10 percent. Um, we worked with stem cell-derived beta cells from Matthias Hebrock's lab 
They do a little bit better, the stem cell, the beta cells derived from stem cells, but still only about half survived in the, um, in the kidney capsule of the mouse and um, about 40 to 50 percent in the um, subcutaneous tissue. And if we encapsulated them, none of them survived. So um, there's been a few people working in, in, in our lab, in our transplant surgery residents working with me, who uh, were trying to make the environment in the subcutaneous and, uh, area and muscle, making that area uh, thrive so that the cells would sur uh, uh, survive in there. And they're working in conjunction with uh, uh, Cheesy Tong in our, in our immunology lab. And we've tried all sorts of things. Each one of these makes it a little bit better. But it wasn't until actually two years ago that Casey Ward, who's one of the surgery residents now working in the lab, had just finished his endocrine rotation. And you all are familiar with when we take out parathyroid tissue, you can put it into the forearm. And it grows just, you know, that's where we, it will survive in the forearm. And so Casey thought, well, there's an endocrine tissue that's working. Maybe if we co-transplanted parathyroid tissue with islet tissue, we could get it to survive. And lo and behold, in, if we take human islets and put them again into the immunodeficient mouse, we can reverse diabetes by putting the islets with parathyroid tissue in the subcutaneous tissue. Um, and it, really exciting, because we've never been able to do that. And even more interesting, if you take stem cells and put them into the subcutaneous tissue and transplant them with parathyroid tissue, we can completely reverse diabetes in a mouse model using human cells. So now, now we've got islets working in the forearm and it looks like 100% survive. Remember, only 10% survived in the liver. So now we're thinking sky's the limit because um, maybe, maybe some people are talking about putting pig islets into the forearm. Um, and more importantly, we just, we think we got funding. <laughs> Um, it got a good score. Uh, we find out in two weeks if they're going to fund it as we wanted it to get funded. We're going to try, do a trial in humans. Patients who are already on immunosuppression, um, either with a liver or a kidney transplant, they have to be type 1 diabetic. We're going to, we're funded, we hope we, we've got funding for eight patients to do a subcutaneous transplant of deceased donor islets with uh, parathy parathyroid tissue from the same donor. And if this works, um, uh, and I, I, I could talk to you for about two hours about why it's working um, and why the stem cell people want to fund this, um, uh, we can really um, expand it. And if we, have, if, we can, if we can use an unlimited source, um, it'll blow the lid off of how we uh, manage uh, diabetes. Uh, so on that, I just want to um, uh, acknowledge the huge effort uh, that is going on at UCSF. The person up in the upper left is Kizi Tong. You've met her before at this meeting. She's our transplant immunologist. That's uh, Julie Snedden on the uh, bottom right. She's a um, islet biologist, Mike German, uh, islet biologist, and Jeff Bluestone, an immunologist. Um, that's Matthias Hebach, who's making stem cells, um, uh, upper right-hand corner. Um, that's Tejal Desai, um, who's the head of bioengineering at UCSF. Uh, she's trying to figure out a better strategy for encapsulating the islets. That's the whole team of people who are involved in the islet transplant program. That's Andy Pelselt in the middle, um, who's uh, really spearheaded the clinical effort. And on the left is uh, Greg Zott, who is the guy who isolates the islets. And those are my colleagues in... Uh, surgery. Um, many who are there, we unfortunately have a liver meeting, the international liver meeting is, is uh, this week, so it's the um, men, Nancy and John uh, and uh, Sangmore are at that meeting. Uh, so I'll stop there and um, entertain any questions you might have. Thank you very much. So in the patients we are currently referring those who have diabetes and uh, we refer them for kidney transplant. Are you automatically looking to them if they qualify for any of them? These? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. And also, as an yeah. extension, yeah. the patients who are already listed, I yes. have several 
<laughs> young patients with type 2 diabetes, yes. are you going to look at their records as well? Yeah, so I, 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 I would have planted you in the audience to ask that question because, um, first of all, um, at the moment, um, the waiting time for a simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant is less than two years, less than even a year for some blood types. So these patients will move to the top of the list. So it's not a trivial question. If we can really help a person, um, at the moment, they're trying to use all the pancreases uh, that can be used. It's about 20% of donors have a suitable pancreas. So it will expedite time on the list for these patients. And not only that, it may be the right thing to do. So we went back and we tried to, we, we didn't know how to treat We have a very large waiting list. So I screened, um, uh, I, I didn't do it, I should say all, all the wonderful coordinators in the audience did, and tried to find um, uh, the patients who had low BMI, relatively low BMIs, less than 30. So we're going for the phenotypic type ones. and. Um, probably not on excessive amounts of insulin, you know, because the patients that are profoundly resistant, you know, will put in a pancreas and they'll still need insulin, then really what are we doing? Um, so we screened and um, we're, we're looking. We found about 30 patients and we screened those patients and we were down to like 15. Uh, the patient that I just told you about that we transplanted, uh, that's about six months out with a normal hemoglobin A1C, she was one of the patients that we, we screened. Surprisingly, we haven't come across a lot of them, but I, I think they are out there. I think you're dead on, and I think if you identify, if you're seeing any patients on dialysis that you think, oh, we, we should consider this, please call us, and we will, uh, we will immediately evaluate them. But very important, thank you for asking. And we are considering them moving forward prospectively. Yes. So, sorry. My name is Stephanie, and actually, um, when we get the referrals, speak into the. Sorry. Yeah. So, when we get the referrals, we actually have our intake. Um, they have some certain criteria that if they have the they're younger, their BMI is this. They actually get it. We actually review it first, and we actually put them on a Wednesday clinic where the surgeons are available. And we can determine at that time, these are the type twos, if they can qualify for SPK or kidney and pancreas. So we started doing that quite a, um, almost a year or so already since we started thinking about transplanting type two patients. So we screened them. So we did, so Dr. Stock did, we, we found 30 or so. We did contact most of them. A few of them actually came in in clinic and um, personally, I, I don't have the number, but I think we ended up maybe listing, I would say maybe five That's or six. About right. That's about right. For SPK I, I, who are type two. But, Some but, of them were ruled out because they're actually not on uh, insulin at all. Yeah, right. Yeah. So if uh, it, it's, uh, you have to keep in mind that patients, uh, as, as once they develop renal failure, they sometimes don't need the insulin. Um, in any case, it's been only five, but I think there is a big population out there that we're missing that we're not seeing. And we're paying attention to it prospectively, but retrospectively, if you identify patients, please let us know. We'll, we'll reevaluate them right away. Thank you. Thank you very much.